Good morning and welcome to OpenSIM 2023. Many of you will recognize me, but for those who don't, my name is Carl Sandrock. I used to work at the University of Pretoria studying process control, and I'm now the head of data science and AI at a company called ProQuo AI. I haven't missed many of these gatherings, so I'm very sorry that I can't join you in person. I'm sure that those of you who are attending in person will be having wonderful conversations prompted by amazing presentations by some of the leaders in computer simulation and optimization in South Africa. If this is your first time attending, I encourage you to take full advantage of these conversations outside of the formal tasks. This is where bonds are formed and new ideas are often kicked off. When I was asked to suggest a topic for this year, I immediately suggested AI. I remember that at the previous OpenSIM in October 2022, we were talking about the image generation tools that had just been released. DAL-E had been re released earlier in the year and Midjourney and Stable Diffusion had made their public releases a few months before. And we were sharing images and thinking about what would come in the future. I don't remember if we spent much time talking about it, but AlphaFold had also vastly expanded their protein structure database earlier in the year, leading to much wider use by scientists. OpenAI had also released Whisper, which was a huge leap forward in terms of transcription accuracy for speech to text. Just about a month later, OpenAI released ChatGPT and the much improved GPT 3.5. I think for many people, this was the watershed moment. These language generation models and the straightforward chat interface made AI accessible to everyone. It appeared to be miraculously good at answering questions and solving problems. Since then, it seems like there is a new press release every day about larger, more capable models. The release of GPT-4 in March of this year upped the ante. Machines have never felt more like they could be generally intelligent. The large language models have been taking much of the spotlight this year, but the image generation models have become better as well. And there have been some very interesting forays into music generation. Here's an example I pulled out of the mid journey server in September. I don't have an account, so I'm just looking at what other people are generating. The idea that I could just describe a scene and have an image like this come back to me is still blowing my mind. Lately, I've also been seeing examples like the ones I'm showing here of people figuring out how to produce very compelling illusions by using control net and a masked image to influence what stable diffusion is generating. My last image generation example is from a model that has not been released at the time that I'm recording this. OpenAI has announced DALL-E 3, and this is taken from their announcement. This new model is better at producing artistic output and also managed to do readable text. Very impressive. Then there are the multimodal LLM models. GPT-4 is the big one, and this example from their press release was the one that showed me something new is going on here. It might not be immediately apparent, but I'd like to point out some important facts. First, the input here is a scanned image of a question in an exam. It is also in French. The prompt is in English and requires the model to look up the question number and understand something about the situation in the image on figure one. This might be a relatively simple physics problem, but many of the feats on display here were completely impossible to imagine two years ago. Just imagine explaining to somebody that you could take a picture of an exam have an artificially intelligent uh, model read that image and answer the question, all without intermediate steps. Now here is a very interesting one. These guys are generating music using image generation. The spectrogram on the left is the actual source of the music. This allows them to do morphs between prompts like the one I'll play now from church bells to bubblegum Europop. 
generation technology. It's going to be wild in the future. But let's take a step back. As I was contemplating what contribution this keynote could make at a simulation conference, I kept thinking about the history of mechanization. And I hope that you'll bear with me as I travel back in time to gather the threads. During the 1700s, there was a huge increase in the ability of machines to replace labor that had previously required humans. The Industrial Revolution had many different drivers. You can think of it as replacing animal and human energy with water and steam, or the development of better materials for producing machines, or just as automation. You can see an example of the magnitude of labor that could be replaced by, st by steam engines in the picture of a cotton mill on the right. Note these shafts connected to the machines by belts. These would all be driven by a single steam engine. We see clearly that there is a separation between the energy source and the consumer. I'll stay with weaving for a moment. So it's, it's a critical path um, on the story of computing machines. The jacquard head was an innovation that allowed unheard of flexibility in the production of textiles. The most innovative part was using punched card stock to control the configuration of the rods that controlled the weaving. Now, not everyone was sold on this idea. Notably, the Luddite movement protested against machines displacing skilled textile workers. You could now have steam-driven looms operated automatically by unskilled workers. A little bit later, Charles Babbage comes up with the idea of calculating machines after growing frustrated with the errors he found in tables of logarithms. He designs a machine called the Difference Engine, which would evaluate polynomial series. This machine was not constructed in his lifetime, but this reconstruction was produced by the Science Museum for the bicentennial year of Babbage's birth. It is hand cranked, and the calculations happen in this central area called the mill. Babbage was limited by the accuracy of the construction techniques available at the time, but also understood from the beginning that errors would be propagated through the system unless there was an error correcting technique in place. This is why the system was digital. That is to say, it operated on digits rather than smooth rollers. Uh, this is important to make sure that we have an exact answer at every crank of the wheel. This device on the side is where the tables of numbers calculated by the machine would be assembled, ready to be sent to a printing press. Now, one of the reasons that the difference engine wasn't constructed in Babbage's lifetime is that he became distracted with the design of a new machine called the analytical engine, which was much more general as a computing device. Influenced by the jacquard head, he designed his machine to be programmed using punch cards. A noble lady called Ada Lovelace, who was quite young at the time that she uh, met Babbage, um, was introduced to the device by Babbage himself and spent a great deal of time thinking about and discussing the consequences of the machine. She noticed and expressed clearly that you could produce music or poetry with these devices too, even though Babbage never really thought of that application himself. In 1937, Alan Turing presents a universal computer in a paper which addresses the idea of universal computability. The image I'm showing here is of one possible version of the machine. Turing himself doesn't go into the actual mechanics very much, but he does explain a scheme whereby a single machine could be produced that could be reconfigured uh, to do the work of any other computing machine. While universal computing machines had already been developed, this was the first time we had proof of their universality. It's amazing how little you need to make a universal machine. There are many examples of builds of these kinds of machines, but this one by Mike Davy is really very impressive. It uses white film stock as the tape with a pen for writing the symbols, an optical reader to read them and an erasing cylinder to erase them. It's amazing to watch and I encourage you to download the full video uh, from YouTube. A little more than 10 years after showing that a universal computer exists, Turing is imagining machines that can think. He proposes a test now known as the Turing test and spends a lot of time countering common arguments to the idea that we uh, hear even today. Although large scale computers are starting to be used, they're still not ready to be used by uh, modern standards. From a completely different angle, 
Marvin Minsky builds a network of 40 randomly connected HEP synapses in what appears to be the first artificial neural network. It can solve simple problems like mazes with self-learning rather than explicit instructions. This maze-solving problem is quite popular at the time, and Claude Shannon also builds a machine that can solve mazes using relays. In the 50s, the IBM 704 was released, 1954. And this is the first mass-produced computer with hardware for floating-point arithmetic. It uses vacuum tubes. Um, it's notable because it was the target of the first Fortran compiler, as well as the first implementation of Lisp, and the first computer music program called Music. An interesting piece of trivia is that the 704 also produced the first synthesized human speech and singing, which Arthur C. Clarke was so impressed by that he referenced the song produced in this way in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Note the punch card interface. Even though the 704 was unreliable and limited in capacity, it allowed a level of abstraction from the hardware that we, that we take for granted these days. You were focusing on your Fortran code, not on the wiring of the machine. In the same year that the 704 was released, Bell Labs completed the first prototype of a transistor-based computer, called a Tradic, which was smaller, faster, and used less power than the 704. It's worth spelling out the change that occurred in the 1900s. Mechanical calculating machines like the difference engine and even later electromechanical or electronic devices were built or hardwired to do only one task, even though they may be fed different inputs. You'd need to build another machine to produce a different output or reconfigure the one that you had. The idea of a universal machine that could take a program as well as input and remain the same produce, uh, while producing different outputs eventually morphed into the idea of a stored program computer in the 1950s. At this time, you were more likely to think of the program accepting input than the computer. The program was running in the computer. Also consider that the Fortran programmers were now set free from their substrate. When transistors replaced vacuum tubes, they didn't need to relearn a special language that could run on transistors. In the 60s, we also see more sophisticated neural networks appearing. Frank Rosenblatt's Perceptron was still using dedicated hardware rather than code, but was successful in its task of image recognition. The early pioneers of these systems saw them as an alternative mode of automated reasoning rather than another way of programming computers. Only two years after the release of the IBM 704, John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, Nathaniel Rochester and Claude Shannon coined the term artificial intelligence. The term machine learning follows a few years later. There is an explosion of experiments in computers that go beyond simple algorithms in the 1960s. In 1960, Branch and Bound is developed for discrete programming. 1965 sees the release of the first expert systems and the ELISA chatbot and Shirdloop programs follow shortly after. I'll go into a bit more detail about ELISA and Shirdloop since I think they illustrate some in interesting points. Joseph Weizenbaum writes ELISA in 1966 and is surprised to find that people really enjoy talking to the system. ELISA uses very simple rules but can often result in surprisingly believable text. You can see a sample conversation here. I find ELISA interesting for two reasons. The first is how simple the general algorithm is. I've pasted the algorithm given in the Wikipedia page for the project, and given that you have a rule engine that can evaluate these rules, the whole system becomes quite easy to understand. By the way, the ELISA system could accept different personas as separate scripts, but most people talking about ELISA mean the doctor script, which does this analysis-like conversational mirroring. The second is described as the ELISA effect. People really love talking to ELISA-like systems. They like it even when they are told how the system works, even when they have been programming the systems themselves. They ascribe properties to the system that it clearly doesn't have. This might sound familiar to people talking to ChatGPT. Now let's talk about Shirdlu. In case you're wondering, the name comes from a sequence of characters, Ituin Shirdlu, that represent the frequencies of letters in the English language. 
Schoedlu is a reasoning system that operates on simulated microworld called, called block world. The demonstration of the system was incredibly impressive, showing some very interesting reasoning abilities. It learned, for instance, that you can't stack pyramids and could do elaborate reasoning solutions about additional properties given by the operator. Unfortunately, the demos were effectively staged and the system just couldn't ha be handed over to somebody and work as well as it appears to in these scripted situations. The demos caused a great deal of excitement and the planner language that Shirley was written in uh, influenced the development of Prolog. The seeming success of symbolic AI like Shirley, which was rule-based and learned through extending the rule set, uh, combined with publication of the book Perceptrons by Minsky and Papert, led to an uh, uh, increase in research for symbolic AI. Another interesting piece of triv trivia, Seymour uh, Papert was a South African who got his first PhD at WITS, his second at Cambridge, and was one of the co-inventors of the logo language. Anyway, Perceptrons focused a lot on the limitations of single layer networks, and it seemed that rule-based systems, perhaps written in Prolog, which came out in 1972, were just much more capable and reliable. Unfortunately, in 1973, Sir James Lighthill wrote a report for the UK Parliament on the state of AI. He called out the combinatorial explosion that result from rule-based systems and concluded that the entire endeavor would only ever be able to solve toy problems. Minsky and Schenk later coined the term AI winter in 1984 when they correctly predict the demise of Lisp machines. So we enter the 1990s with three broad ideas of how you can get computers to do useful things, each kind of nested into the next. We start with normal imperative programming. In this paradigm, the user comes up with an algorithm and translates it into a programming language. The computer executes the algorithm and produces outputs. Another way of thinking about things is the declarative approach, which should be familiar to the attendants of this conference, who are used to approaching problems by modeling physical systems or solving optimization problems, but also encompasses rule-based systems like Shirdloo. Here, the user comes up with a set of constraints and some kind of objective, and the computer finds a solution which satisfies the constraints and perhaps maximizes or minimizes an objective function. Lastly, there's the learning paradigm, in which the contribution of the human is mostly to gather examples or training data. The computer then fits or trains a model to the examples or training data, and output is produced by doing inference using the trained model. Note that the solution of the declarative statements usually involves development of sophisticated algorithms and that fitting models to training data involves developing large models and solving challenging optimization problems. Now let's talk about the advances that led to the current state of the art where both image recognition and language manipulation is at a non-trivial level. It's worth pointing out that some of the groundwork was done during the AI winter. Jan LeCun's name should be familiar to anyone following the resurgence of neural networks. He was convinced that these systems could be much more capable than rule-based systems. In 1989, his team showed that convolutional neural networks could perform well in recognizing handwritten signals from images. The name convolutional comes from the bottom layers in this diagram, where you can see a small kernel is being moved across the input image, leading to a large number of hidden units. Ironically, given the future developments, they implemented their system in LISP. The LSTM network was developed at the end of the 90s, leading to the application of neural networks to larger linear datasets like audio and video. This diagram from the LSTM paper so shows that these recurrent networks um, have back-connected units back-connected into themselves. As a side note, 1997 is the year that I started studying chemical engineering at the University of Pretoria. I lived through the pessimism about AI in my postgraduate studies, where I can clear, clearly remember leaving my pattern recognition course deeply skeptical about the abilities of neural networks. In the late 2000s, when I had already started my career as an academic, large training datasets like ImageNet were starting to be assembled. 
driving involvement by providing a common base for comparisons of accuracy. This was a major driver of advances in the field, since everybody could compare their results to each other in an objective way. GPUs only step into the game in 2009, when they were first shown to be useful to train large neural networks. It's around this point that I started seeing the idea that traditional feature engineering wasn't as necessary as it used to be, since deep neural networks could use earlier layers to transform the data into useful features for the next layers. 2013 saw the release of variational autoencoders, deep reinforcement learning, and word to vec I'm going to explain word to vec in more detail. In the groundbreaking 2013 paper, Efficient Estimation of Word Representations in Vector Space, researchers from Google proposed two new model architectures for computing vector representations for words from large datasets. The Continuous Bag of Words, or CBAO method, tries to predict a target word from a set of context words, while the Skipgram model tries to predict the context words from a target word. An interesting thing happens when they train model using this architecture. The vectors assigned to the words start to take on a semantic role. An example from the paper is to find a word that has the same relationship to small that biggest has to big. Surprisingly, the following process can be used to answer the question. First, we find the vectors allocated to big and biggest. Then, we find the difference between these vectors. We find the vector for small, and we add the delta that we just calculated onto that. We then search the database for the word vector that is nearest to this new point. It turns out that this is smallest. This means we can do math with vectors. This concept of embedding words into semantically meaningful vector spaces is extremely important for modern natural language data processing. Continuing on our journey to modern systems, the 2014 development of generative adversarial networks was groundbreaking in terms of producing usable images. The original paper contains several examples of these networks generating samples that appear similar to their training sets. Soon, they were being employed to generate very realistic portraits, like this one. People started loading apps on their phone that could transfer styles, allowing you to appear as an oil painting, for example. While generative adversarial networks were first on the scene to generate interesting images, they have almost been completely supplanted by diffusion models and transformers, the papers for which were published in 2015 and 2017 respectively, examples of which we saw at the beginning of the talk. A big trend in the development of these huge models is the use of unsupervised learning techniques rather than reliance on large label datasets, as well as figuring out more efficient architectures that can be trained efficiently on modern hardware. Before I continue, it's worth pointing out that Gartner places generative AI at the peak of the hype cycle, predicting that we're two to five years from the plateau of productivity. I wonder why reinforcement learning is so low on the slope, but I also acknowledge that there are big promises being made every day, and it's hard to tell the hyperbole from reasonable predictions. What I am seeing is the emergence of a fourth way of getting computers to do useful things. It relies on our previous learning paradigm, but this time our training data is a huge corpus of text or images, and we interface with that with uh, these produced models in a novel way the natural language prompt. As soon as these large language models came out, they started being studied in this weird anthropomorphized way. I was struck by this recent paper where the authors compare various prompts for their problem. The fact that a think step by step kind of prompt is better than no prompt at all is old news by now, but I was surprised by the magnitude of improvement. And look at this interesting phrase. Who would have thought to say this to a computer? And what would make it work better? I think about this paper called More is Different by Nobel laureate P.W. Anderson often. In it, he describes the folly of reductionist thinking exemplified by the chain of fields I show here. Surely, chemistry forms the basis of molecular biology, for instance. But, he says, this hierarchy does not imply that science X is just applied Y. At each stage, entirely new laws, concepts, and generalizations are necessary 
requiring inspiration and creativity to just as great a degree as in the previous one. Psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry. I am now ready to take the final point. All the things we have seen in the history of the development of thinking machines have proceeded in a way where technology preceded formalization and understanding. If you think about the Industrial Revolution, where we built these machines before we developed the thermodynamics and control system theory that we later used to make them better, in terms of computing, we have developed layers on top of layers, and each layer has been a valid target of study, with the layers below not buying you much understanding of the layer above. A deep understanding of hardware design, architecture and manufacture may make you a slightly better C programmer, but it doesn't help much if you're writing Python code. Similarly, the modeling systems used in the declarative mode abstract so far from the mechanics that you need a completely different skill set. And while a good choice of neural network architecture might buy some performance on particular hardware, to a greater extent we are pursuing different goals when it comes to training these networks than when we are designing hardware. Now, at the last layer of using these large systems to do useful things, we are seeing an emergence of a new science of prompt engineering and learning about the behavior of these models is a science in itself. Like Anderson, I want to urge you to avoid the idea that these new systems are just predicting one token ahead or just curve fitting. Yes, this is true, in the same way that your phone is just doing elementary logical operations. But this approach doesn't help you to become a power user and you'll be missing out on a huge new field of endeavor. I'll leave it to the other speakers to talk about practical applications, and I hope that you have found this history and explanation as illuminating to hear as I found it to research and to write.